Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Bill Collistead. I'm the public policy manager for the Iowa Developmental Disability Council, and you are attending Advocacy 101. Um, there's a lot of great advocates already on the fall, on the phone, I can tell, or on the Zoom. Um, we're going to get started in about three or four minutes. We did have 24 people registered, and we have a little, uh, right around 12 people on the call. So we're going to give them a little more time to get in. We're hoping that people didn't think it was 12.30, not 12.15. So give us a few minutes here and we'll get started. Glad you're here. This is being taped, right, Bill? Yes. Okay. Yep. In case I miss information or can't write it down fast enough. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started here in a few minutes. We had a few more people register, so we're going to give them a chance to, if they were just on our capital chat, to get a, maybe wrap up their lunch and jump on. Oh, I haven't eaten yet today. Oh. <laughs> I ate for lunch. So that, I mean, that makes two. Me three. <laughs> right. And we really won't mind if you guys want to eat lunch while we're on. Yeah. So go Maybe right ahead. We don't want to don't, have anybody starve because we're doing advocacy. <laughs> just don't tell us what it is. I'm very hungry. So just and make sure you <laughs> mute when you eat, Brady and Kristen. <laughs> I'm not eating until after this is over. So don't have to worry about that one. I'm done Here. eating, but I will mute when I drink. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, I'm not eating <laughs> either, but uh, I'm going to eat ramen noodles. <laughs> Just a PB and J sandwich for me, so nothing too exciting. <laughs> he's not saying whether he's eaten or not. He's no, not yet. I haven't oh. eaten. Sorry. I haven't eaten. <laughs> it will be a PB and J sandwich. <laughs> But about that before about the uh, two thousand dollar limit that was brought up in the in the uh, legislature one, I remember Liz Matney said that's a that's a federal issue, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So what are they trying to do with that? Make it more money, less money? But you know, even though it's a federal issue, though, um, you know, if folks are working, those those limits are not applicable if they are actually have a disability and are working and people wow. do get used by that. So um, they can be on the um, Medicaid for employed people with disabilities if they're working and that that raises their what they can have in savings. Yeah, I'm on that program. So that's good to know. <laughs> I've not and, heard of that program. And people can also put their their money into an iABLE account too. And we'll be doing another webinar in April and talk more about the iABLE accounts as well. Hey, Bill, is there any legislature that's going to be on this one? Yeah, I don't believe so. I don't think we had any sign up. Okay. So, well, we'll let's get started. I'm going to have uh, Brady kind of welcome everybody, and then, then we'll kind of get into the training. The floor is yours, Brady. <laughs> All righty. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Advocacy 101. Um, we are partnering today with the IODD Council I was with Disability in Action as well as InfoNet. Uh, my name is Brady Werner, and I currently serve as the vice chair for the Iowa Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, and uh, we'll be taking over as chair for the Iowa DD Council, um, I believe, starting here in July. Um, a little bit about why. Um, I do what I do as far as advocating is um, a lot of people uh, when it comes to trying to advocate either for a loved one or themselves, they just can't do it. And so that's when our self advocates come in and um, get information about how they can advocate for that individual. And then it's 
then you know their responsibility to take that information and advocate. So, uh, um, advocacy has been a big um, part of my life since. Oh, uh, it's been a long time. Um, you know, as uh, me as a young kid growing up with a disability, um, anger problems, and having a sister, biological sister that has grown up with intellectual disabilities and problems with behavior and stuff. Um, it's, as a child, it was a struggle, but um, I'm just glad I could be sitting here today and sharing my story and, um, and advocating for other people that need assistance that can't do it for themselves. Thank you, Brady. Really appreciate um, Brady kind of leading us off. Um, he's a great example for all of our members on our council, how to be an advocate. And, to, you know, in a lot of what we're going to talk about today, I think Brady just naturally does. I think a lot of our self-advocates naturally do. Um, but advocating with your legislators can be overwhelming, can be concerning. You kind of look at that picture of the Capitol and it seems... Um, um, it kind of seems intimidating just by going in there and the grand stature of it. And then you're going to meet with someone who's always, um, you know, maybe in a tie and pretty serious about what they're doing. And so just the whole process can be kind of intimidating. Brady does a really good job of just sharing his story in a very uh, passionate and uh, diligent and, 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 uh, way that that seems to really resonate with people so i'll probably refer to him and to you and a number of our self-advocates about how they are sharing their messages so uh, again my name is bill collisted i am the public policy manager with the iowa developmental disability council and we're glad that you're here um, we're going to spend you know a little over 45 minutes to 50 minutes talking about advocacy at any point that you would like to raise your hand or or add to it um I'll take breaks and make sure that we provide some feedback, but there's a little bit of ground setting, kind of talking about what's going on in the government, and then a little bit about how the processes work, and then at the end, we'll really get into, now that we understand who's who, who are the players at the Capitol, or who are the players in our local politics, we'll figure out how to advocate. So there's a little bit of a beginning part, um, but before we get started, I just kind of, you know, and it's a little bit different because usually I do this in person. So I'm going to have you use your emojis and your thumbs up. But um, have you ever in your life felt powerless and that maybe your voice didn't matter? And so you could raise your hand on your screen or you can give a thumbs up. I can see some of the pictures there. But if you've ever felt like you haven't been heard, I see Susan Summons giving a thumbs up. Um, Kristen has. Uh, Brady has. I know I have. Eric. Yep. Tiffany. Um, certainly we feel that way, right? We feel like, you know, I can remember maybe that was some of the first feelings I had of that was as a kid, you know, not understanding why maybe I couldn't have more snacks or watch TV longer or set my own bedtime or, um, you know, why I had to be on a different set of the floor than my sisters. I, that was a little more, I think my mom keeping me away from my three older sisters because they, uh, um, but but feeling like powerless, like there was nothing I could do or feeling like my voice doesn't matter. Um, sometimes those things can be kind of frustrating. Um, here's a question. How many people know their senator or their representative? How many people know who they are? Can you give me a thumbs up? And if you, I know Brady one. Does, Kristen does. One, one of them. Suzanne or Susan does. Um, Roxanne does. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about that. How many people have had a conversation with them and have reached out to them and spoken to them? I do on Facebook. Yeah, a number of you guys are, yeah. Yep. I, just, I just sent an email and I didn't get a response back. So I don't know if he got it or <laughs> if that's just the way it operates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, we had our advocacy training this year at our Make Your Mark conference and and they, they talked about the volume of emails that they get, but I still think emails are a way that they track feedback. Sometimes they don't always respond, but if, if it's in regards to a bill that they're connected to, um, I think often they, they, they track that and they understand how many people are concerned about the waiting list, for example, and especially if they get a large volume. Um, I think another thing that they do is they forward it on to people 
I, you know, they're, they're pretty, they have to, when I mean, you think there's 160 committees that were formed just this week, they're moving at a really fast pace in the three months they're up at the Capitol. So they might get an email, hopefully, and they forward it to a chair. That's what we've got to kind of think about. But we, you know, that's a great way to connect. Um, how many have visited with them at the Capitol? How many people have been down to the Capitol and had a chance to? In the past, I have. Chris yes. has done the past. Brady has. I, yep. I have a long time. Well, you haven't long. had any in-person advocacy days in a few years, so I can't. Oh. No. Yeah, we've all been. Hugh has. Yep. Eric has. Good. I, I was more active back in the days of Harkin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, good. That was a good time to be involved, right? Yes. So. Uh, How do you track who's on which one? How do you track which well, we'll, bills we'll and get committees that, are yeah. on? We'll get to that. Thank you for asking that. We, we're going to get to that a little bit further into the training. It's almost. Oh, that's fine. I just didn't end, want to forget. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, who's who and how do you get there? So let's let's talk. Let's talk, you know, big top level, kind of talk about the federal government. And just a few things that I'd point out in this slide is there there are two branches. There's the House of Representatives and there are there's the Senate. And so if you look at the federal government, there are 435 members. That's a lot. And so, you know, Iowa, I was just going to, I should know this. Um, maybe Brooke knows for sure. I think we have six representatives or is it four? Back in the day, we had seven at one time. Is that what you're yeah. asking? Yeah, one right. time I had seven representatives. And so it's broke out by each state by their population. So I think we are down less. I just, I apologize. I don't know that number. And then, but four. every state, four, that's right. Thank you. Four U.S. representatives, two U.S. senators. Thank you, Eric. And then uh, um, that's why I said this could be a collaborative learning together for a lot of this. Um, and in the Senate, we have 100 members, and every state has two from each state. And those are year-around positions, frequent breaks in between those sessions. And so it's important to know at the federal level, you have two senators um, speaking on your behalf, um, and you might have a representative that's representing your specific area. Um, but there are four that are rep recognizing or representing Iowa. So similarly in Iowa, they, we have the same thing. We have the uh, bicameral legislation. We have two branches, the House and the Senate. Um, there are 50 state senators and there are 100 representatives. And so again, there are regions in which there is, those are broken out and they have districts that they represent. So it's just to kind of break it down, very similar numbers in a way, but so you kind of need to know maybe who your federal person is on federal issues or the state. And as Brooke reminded us, if you were joining us in our capital chat, she had said that um, she had said that while some some laws might be a federal issue, it's also important to let your state representative know how you feel about that or why it's important to you, because there is a back and forth between both of those uh, entities. So. All right, there's another Question. part of policy. Go ahead, Kristen. What does bicameral mean? So two the words I don't know. <laughs> yep, oh, I went the wrong way. Um, it's, there's two parts to the legislator. There's two, bi is two. So there is two branches. Yes. There's the House and the Senate. It's just a fancy way of saying two branches. Okay. Thanks for that, yep. So, you know, this is something that has really resonated to me. So I've been with the council um, coming up on two years here and, uh, um, it, you know, now understanding how things work, that, that quote at the top, all politics is local. Um, if you're really wanting to make a difference, you, you know, really being involved in your city, really being involved in your town, with your mayor, with your city manager, that that's where you can be most uh, intimately tied with that. It might broaden as you move into school boards or county government, um, but that's a great way to get connected. So you, so when you think about our governing bodies, you have the federal um, legislation, you have um, the state senators, and then you also have your local government, which might make up your city council, your city mayor, your city manager. Um, there are school boards that have a huge impact. There's county government. There are usually three to five elected supervisors. Um, per county and then, and you can find more information from those websites in your county there as you're looking for that. So just again, kind of setting up the stage of who's who. So let's, 
let's talk about the legislative process. Um, how many people are really familiar with how a bill goes from introduction to becoming a law? Have you, have you kind of thought about this for a while? I think people kind of understand the process. Um, Eric's got a big thumbs up. So usually um, <laughs> anyone given legislate, um, anyone can give a legislator an idea. Brady talked earlier in our capital chat about waiting lists today. Um, last year, we had uh, one of our advocates who brought up um, changing tables at the state of Iowa. That had been around for a while, but she really made a connection with her representative. So anyone can propose or talk to their representative about that, but only a legislator or a state agency or the governor can request a bill. And so they usually do that in the first part. And so we learned earlier today that on the 21st of January, was the first part of the year that people had to introduce their bills. So I'm not going to go all the way into this. So if you're kind of starting to think about how long is he going to go over each one, I just wanted to kind of give that idea that who can introduce that. And once that's introduced, it goes to a committee of people. And that's usually a mix of four to five people that review the bill and they decide <clears throat> if it should move forward. Um, the, then the bill is brought forward um, from that committee to a floor vote. And at the floor vote, Again, that, so it could be brought up from the House. Your representative could bring it forward from a committee and they can make a bill on um, the waiting list. I'll use that as an example today as we follow that through, but it could be something to address the waiting list um, for people who are living out of state who previously were on the waiver. They could bring that bill forward. It could go to committee and then they would move that forward to a floor vote. And at that point, the majority has to vote that that bill should move forward. And at that point, then it will go to um, another committee where they'll spend a little more time going through. Uh, they, again, that's about three to four people. And then it goes to that. As you're thinking about time frames, we talked earlier, Kristen, remember about the funnel? So you have these 500 bills that were presented, and then they're going to narrow those down. And some, some, some bills will not make it out of committee. Um, Amy talked about a bill today in regards to having to produce your driver's license with uh, uh, with your elected ballot. She doesn't think that's going to move forward, so that may not even come out of committee to a floor vote. But one in regards that. to the waiting list certainly could. Then from there, another flow, floor vote, and then there's amendments. And then at that point, if it's a strong bill, the governor will sign that and it becomes a law. So for example, um, when you're thinking of those dates, you know, remember they're there for a hundred day session usually. And so there's the first few weeks where they propose the bill. That's usually in the first three weeks. Then there's a three to five week funnel where they try to narrow those bills down from 500 this year down to maybe a hundred, maybe, maybe, you know, it depends on how many they pass. And from there they get into those final amendments and then they become a law possibly if they're voted through. So, Bill, we've got a couple of questions. If you yeah, take go them. for it. Yep. Well, Brady has a question, but I think Roxanne's first while we're on this, I think that number two should be subcommittee, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I think Roxanne's question was, don't they go to subcommittee first? And that is correct. I think we just have it wrong on the slide. Yeah. Committee. So, committee. <laughs> Bill, yes. is there places that you could link to images that explains this in pictures? I know the bill becomes a law process. That's an image or that's a, um, a paper that's provided um, on the legislative website that explains this in an image form. People can see that. And also other documents are on the legislative website where uh, you can talk about what committees people are on. Yep, I'm Eric, that's a great question. I am gonna go to the Iowa legislator website here at the end of the presentation and I'm going to make note to kind of look at that image and share that but also show the committees. Yep. Thank you. Um, Brady, you had a question? Sure. So Bill, if I have like a concern of something that's happening either personally or let's say something happened at, within my community, how do I go about setting up a town hall meeting with my local city officials and like my local senator and my representative, how do I go about setting up a town hall meeting? Um, 
so, so Brady, there's a there's a few different options with that. Um, because I've been wanting just, to do it here in Glenwood. I just I don't yeah. know what routes to go to. So what what so we did have a town hall this last fall up in Mason City. There was a group of advocates who I keep looking over here, you guys, because that's where I can see your visual picture. So I apologize if you're wondering why I'm looking off. I'm not reading my email as we, I'm talking here. I so Brady, the um so that group, just to give an example, they had had a town hall and they reached out to all of their representatives and their senators and they had a date set and they had food set and they invited them one evening to come talk about issues that they had and they did an introductory letter. Um, that was a proposal that they had submitted to the DD Council because we were looking for people to um, to host if they were interested, we would support them. So I sat down with them prior to that and worked on their invites. I helped work with their um, legislative agenda, the things that they wanted to talk about. And then they really did all the legwork. They they called them, they reached out to them, and they had 100% attendance. They all showed up. It was really an impressive event. That's, that's an example that the DD Council offered. Um, if you were just to do that on your own, you might have, a, and we'll talk about this later in advocacy, you might have a group of people who have shared interests. Um, I know you live, um, Brady at Glenwood, and there might be a group of people that you have an advocacy group. I know Mosaic is a service agency that has an advocacy group. You might invite, because of the way the pandemic is right now, you might set up a Zoom meeting on your own with a group of four or five people from that area, you know, that is represented by representatives or senators and invite them to a town hall. Um, I would also encourage people to not always think maybe just in that structure, all of our representatives and senators often are back in their hometowns and communities on the weekends or on Friday and Saturday. Um, the one, in, for example, one in my area in Beaverdale, um, I think once a month meets at a coffee shop and anybody's welcome to show up there. It's on a, I believe it's on um, Saturday mornings and uh, anybody can come and they could raise questions or they could have a conversation about something. They may want to give a heads up so that the, representative or senators aware. So you could do that on a small level, Brady, like you could you could find out if they're gonna be available and go there, or you could try to host one on your own. Um, you can always reach out to me. Um, we are, or if you remember, part of our um, annual plan is to have some um, local area meetings with representatives that we're going to work with people. And you're on our list, Brady, we would like to have one in your area, so. Well, we will definitely continue to talk about that, Bill, as, as things kind of move forward here. Um, I just want to get a town hall meeting done in Glenwood before I do move. Yeah. Um, thank you, Brady. Uh, Roxanne made a really good point. She said, it's important for advocates to know that people can only provide public testimony during subcommittees. So if you look at that, that number two, that's supposed to say subcommittee, um, meetings. People cannot speak, provide public testimony during full committee meetings, um, nor during floor debates. And then as uh, Roxanne said, once it goes from um, the floor debate here, it goes through committee, then it does have to, after, the, after it's approved from there, then it has to go over to the other chamber and go through approval on that end before it gets to the um, governor and sometimes our companion bill which means the same bills introduced both on the senate and the house so all right okay um bill that just means that if it's a companion bill one of the bills may not make it but the other one will so like, yep you know the house bill won't make it but the senate one will and vice versa and you're right, Eric. Last year, we 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 spoke both at the Senate and also at the House in regards to the voting bill. And there were two very similarly written bills, um, but there were differences in each one. And so we really we really had to be aware as advocates when we we had concerns at the Senate side, what ones we were looking at, and then at the House side, um, and what they. What I would say, Eric, is that you're right. One of them went forward, and I and I think it was on the House side, but they adopted 
information from the other, you know, um, similar bill on the other side. So you're right, one will not come through, but thank you. Yeah, and, and when they don't, they clean up the differences that you're talking about in conference by the end of the process. Yep, yep. So next thing I want to talk a little bit about is the talent bank. And, um, you know, we have a few uh, board members here who are on our DD council or not board members, but council members, um, Brady and uh, um, Hugh and Roxanne and Kristen. So all of our members who are on our council went through the talent bank, which was that um, link there, talentbank.iowa. Um, it's an opportunity to get involved in your um, local government, and it's a way for you to share information. It says, Iowa Talent Bank strives to pair individuals interested in governmental roles in the city, the county, and the state, those looking, those to serve. So it's just a chance for you to really um, get involved, um, find out what's out there. And so I know people are involved, are very interested in uh, advocacy issues for people with disabilities, but they're, they might be involved, we talked about earlier, being um, involved in your local government and that might be a chance for you to be engaged there. So just wanted to lift that up. Try and track the chats here. Yeah, pro cancer, thank you. So advocacy, um, be heard. And so we're gonna talk about, now we're gonna go from just how things are structured and where they where you have opportunities to share your voice and to and then get into actual specific steps of advocacy here um, and I just want to share two things here in this picture um, one is um, you can see Amanda Bilham she's on the right top side there of your picture I think that's how you're looking at it um, she's the mother um, and her daughter's there and she's in a bathroom where there's not a changing table for someone who's older than maybe an infant and so she had to change her daughter um, on the floor. This is a picture she shared with her representative. So you can see Ann Meyer on the bottom left hand side there and myself. Ann told the story of she brought legislation forward to put an adult changing table in all of the rest stops in Iowa as you travel through Iowa and also more some public restrooms. Um, her story there that when she was talking to me about it, I said, you know, how did you get, how did that legislation come forward? How did you, why did you write that? And she said it was a conversation she had with Amanda and that was the picture she saw. Um, and she said the picture really resonated with her. It stuck with her. Um, and the story that Amanda had about having to struggle and make decisions on what trips they could take, where they could go in the community, um, how they could travel. Um, really stuck with her and she really felt like that was something that she wanted to bring forward to the bill. So same kind of thing. She brought that forward and um, while that bill didn't get all the way through and it probably got stopped in one of the subcommittee or committee areas, they did end up putting money in the Department of Transportation budget for those things to be put into those uh, changing tables to be put into rest stops across Iowa. So I would say that's an advocacy win. Um, that example. The other picture, maybe uh, I'm going to put Brooke on the spot. I'm, Brooke, can you see that picture? It's a little grainy. I don't know why it transferred that way, but that's somebody I think you know in the red. Brady? <laughs> what did, I can't remember what Brady won. Brady won something in regards to advocacy. Is anybody? It's not coming to me. Brady, what was it? Um. So this picture of me was taken at the Make Your Mark conference uh, back in September. And um, this year was the first year that the uh, Mia Peterson Award was recognized and given out. Um, Mia Peterson was a strong self-advocate here in the state of Iowa um, that advocated uh, big time for uh, people with disabilities and uh, what was it? This past year, she passed away, and so her family um, wanted to keep Mia's um, advocacy alive here in Iowa. And um, you know, Mia passed, so her family wanted to um, acknowledge Mia's advocacy work, and so they came up with an award called the Mia Peterson Award, which. 
Uh, you can see here in the picture of me holding the award. Um, and Brooke, I can't remember. Uh, this award will be given out every year now at the Make Your Mark. Yes, that's correct. And I believe, um, if I can remember right, uh, deadlines to put in nominations to nominate somebody are, I think they have to be turned in. I think Mike was, uh, Mia's dad said by July, is that correct? To be put in by July, if you're nominating this, somebody. This summer, yeah, we haven't put down the dates yet, but this summer we'll we'll be looking for new applicants. Sure. Brady, I didn't mean to put you in the spot to have to tell about your award. I just I was really proud of you to be on there, and I wanted to give you a chance to be recognized. Brady has done a great job advocating for people across the state, um, um, certainly for people with disabilities, and has really spoken out. and And there's a lot of great examples. Uh, Brady um, raising his voice. And the one that I always kind of sticks out to me most is when Iowa was struck by the derecho. Um, and, and, and so while we were all, everybody was kind of looking across the state of Iowa and determining what happened and what areas got hit the worst, Brady saw a video uh, a channel, uh, one of the TV stations there showed a video of a person in a wheelchair whose front steps had been taken away and they were stuck in their apartment and they didn't have resources, they didn't have food. And he contacted Brooke and I and just said, you know, I feel like the DD council has to do something. They should step forward and do something. And so um, we did send some money to some support agencies in that area. Um, really, and it started with just, you know, that step of advocacy. And that's just one example of Brady sharing his voice and, 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 and telling people, um, sharing a lived experience that kind of made a difference. Now, it didn't go back through a committee or a subcommittee. It wasn't proposed by a legislator. It was more of an immediate local, um, all politics are local action. But um, that's just one example of Brady. We have a lot of great advocates on our council, um, but but an example of Brady doing that. And Brady, we're really proud of you and your award and, and uh, are a great example and the first recipient of uh, the Mia Peters Peterson Award. So thank you guys. So let's get into awesome advocacy. Already. Thanks. Let's get into the advocacy. So we have a um, really a, a fancy book called the Advocacy Toolkit, and it and, it, and I'm not going to go all the way through it. Um, but uh, um, you know, the thing that I would say about the six steps to advocacy, and these are things we've already talked a little bit about, but it's really important to know your legislator, to get to know who your senator is or who your representative is. Um, so that the first time that they hear from you is not when something has went wrong, although you may or that you may have concerns, but but just that they know that you're an advocate and that you have you have a perspective that you think can help shape any legislation they're supporting that might affect somebody with a disability or there might be another issue that you're concerned about. Um, but there's a lot of ways to connect with them, and we'll get, again. I'm going to jump into this at the end and go through some websites, but. Um, the Iowa legislative website is a great way to find out who your person is. Um, you can reach out to them by um, email or text. If it's the local government, there are a lot of local great websites for you to be able to do that. Um, but there are also general phone numbers where you can track down and kind of determine who's who and who's making decisions on your behalf. Um, social media is a great way. I think Kristen said that the, how she connects with her legislators through Facebook. Um, there's Twitter, there's Instagram. All of them are very connected and a lot of that information is found right on that website. Um, and then, as I said earlier, a great way to introduce yourself is through those local events that occur either on the weekend or on Saturdays, or they might have an evening coffee. Um, but I would tell you, my experience has been less people reach out to their um, legislators than, than people who actually do that. And I think all of us think, well, going back to that powerless feeling. We feel like um, maybe they don't want to hear from us, or maybe my issue is not important enough, or maybe they're not going to listen. And I would just encourage you that it does. I gave you two examples before we jumped into this of some different things that have happened where advocacy has really made a difference. And I could give you a list of many of those um, that someone who just was passionate about something made a difference. So the first step you have to know is you have to know who your legislator is. I would encourage you to to really identify what your issue is and be able to boil that down to a simple sentence or, or just a few words. Um, 
One of our legislative priorities this year is to reduce waiting lists. So we could make that a really fancy sentence, or we could put a lot of flowery words in there, or we could just say reduce waiting lists for the HCBS waiver and make it as simple as possible. Um, but you need to know that information as you're kind of doing that and learn the legislative process, which we've talked about. So as you're doing that, you want to identify your issue and start to develop your message. So again, like we talked about our waiting list, we need our legislators to know that there are 17,000 Iowans who are on the waiting list for the waiver. Um, we don't have to make it political. We're not saying we really feel like you should vote this way or you should vote that way, or we really feel like um, we really just want to present them with what the issue is so that they're very clear. Um, yeah, I don't know how many people, I, I know I recognize a lot of faces were on our capital chat, um, but Brady gave an example today where his sister had moved out of the state who had been on the waiver, moved out of state because they weren't able to provide and receive care in Iowa, would like to move back, but but has to go onto a waiting list that's two to three years um, in the waiting to be on a waiting list. That's a great story. It's personal, it's very specific. It, it, it gives an example of someone who's um, not living where their parents are, not living in the state that they would choose to, um, and that had previously been approved for the waiver and then lost their slot. And so um, other things as you're thinking about developing your message is you wanna keep it short, and you want to be polite, and then you want to follow up. So I always remind myself is once I give that message, I want them to remember what it is. So that story is key. And then follow up with an email or maybe that picture, if you remember that picture of Amanda's daughter there. Um, next one is uh, continue to develop that message. And then you want to build your support. And we know that more people is better. Join your organization the call. Um, Brady said something about the town hall. So he might have a group that he would like to work with. You could also do, um, we have a lot of advocacy opportunities through the DD Council. Um, is there anybody who's on the phone who's involved with a group that does some advocacy that we haven't mentioned? Um, Eric, are you involved with a group that you do some advocacy with? I do a lot of um, individual advocacy in my, uh, in Waterloo. Um, I'm not really involved in a group, but I'm involved with the party, well, with one of the political parties up here. And I, I know we didn't want to, uh, get politically partisan here, but I'm very involved with, with the political party up here. So that's how I'm involved. And I wanted to also point out to folks that um, we were talking about um, how to be able to contact legislators and how to be able to contact other elected officials. And we, we know that there's like a directory that's available. And I think it's even online of legislative contact information for contacting your legislators, but there's a, what they call whatever the color of the book is, you can get a legislative directory. It's a little mini book that everybody can get where everybody can ask for. And that's a directory of all the contact information for legislators. Um, also on the local level, you can go to your city council and get a little, it's the same idea, but it's a little larger than an index card here in Waterloo. And it's got all the contact information for everybody in the city government, like the mayor and your council members and things like that. Thank you, Eric, you're a wealth of information. I, I think that's great. And I, you know, there's a, um, there's a group that I know that Brady has been involved with, it's Upgrade Medicaid, and they're really just focused on Medicaid issues. I know that two of their biggest issues are waiting lists and, um, and uh, direct support professionals. So they're a group of people, for example, this Sunday, they're having a letter writing um, party and they're gonna meet by Zoom and they're going to write letters to their legislators. So if they're, you know, uh, I think Susan uh, brought up earlier that she had sent an email, but hadn't heard a response. But if a legislator gets, you know, 25 emails, 30 emails or 30 letters around one issue, that starts to build that support for that issue. Um, another way is we just we've been talking about a lot about this, but getting your message out, whether that's a face to face conversation, whether it's a letter, an email, making appointments with your elected official and visiting your state capital when it's safe. Um, that's a great way. Um, another way you could do it is write a letter to, um, to the editor for your newspaper. And uh, um, I know I'm patting uh, Brady a lot on the back today in this training, but that's why I asked him to do the introduction. But um, our uh, our 
appears at the Capitol, Amy Campbell asked Brady to write maybe a small article that could go in our weekly email that talks about the issue um, about his sister being on a waiting list. And then the last part, you know, we go back to that first question I asked, if you've ever felt unheard is, you know, don't give up, be persistent, be patient. Remember that it's not personal. They have a lot of people who are asking them questions. So you just have to be consistent and persistent with them. Celebrate small wins. Um, Brady doesn't know this, but Brady shared his issue um, at our Capitol chat and Representative uh, Bergen was on the phone call and he texted Amy and asked if we could meet with him next week so he could hear more about the issue. So we'll be connecting Brady, um, but that's, that's, a, that's not a small win. That's a pretty big win, Brady. Um, stay committed, keep going till you accomplish your goal and it takes a long time. And I know that Roxanne had commented on that earlier is that a lot of time legislation that, that 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 we talked earlier about the changing tables legislation that had been proposed for years and years in regards to that but it was really um, the advocacy of that family and then making that connection with that senator so we're really proud of the work that they did there um, but it takes a long time to get the change hey, you would hey, like to see hey bill yes Oh, uh, what was that what was that senator's name again could you put it in chat please? Bergen? yep oh well yep Brady, I'll follow up with you with an email too. Yep. Perfect. I think he's a representative though. Yep, representative. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So those are the six steps. There's some more details in there. And Brooke put the link to our toolkit there that you can get a little more detail there. Um, so how do you how do you tell your story? Um, we've talked about a lot of these things, but this is just me kind of re-emphasizing some of these things. Um, we want, to, we want to be treated the same way, but we want to treat our policymakers with respect. Um, even if they don't agree with you, you want to be respectful and kind, and you want to be polite. Um, be persistent, but patient. Remember, it takes time, so don't give up. And I would just tell you, practice and prepare. You want to be, um, you want to share your message with a few people over and over again and have them give you feedback on how that sounds. Um, I certainly can be a sounding board for that, so could Brooke. Um, so can other advocates if you have shared advocates, but um, it's a really important way for you to kind of share that story, but you want to practice and prepare because you get that chance to meet with them. Um, be clear. You want to stick with a simple and clear message. Um, again, this year, we really tried to, with our legislative priorities, which I think Brooke put in the chat, we want it to be clear that anybody could recite them, that we're concerned about the waiting list, we're concerned about um, the number of people in the workforce and we're concerned about accessibility to Iowa and even just those three words are really clear and then we can get into further detail what does that mean well there's 17,000 people on the waiting list and that's too many or there's a significant workforce shortage and we have examples of people who are not able to get the care that they they deserve or that is needed um, we have an example of an individual who is getting about 50 percent of the care and if he doesn't have a caregiver for the afternoon and he often has to stay in his bed for the afternoon um, because he's otherwise bound, it, um, uses a wheelchair for um, getting around. So it's really clear, um, very specific, and then be personal. You need to let them know their stories um, so that they can understand what those issues are. And then be honest. And this is a key one is, you know, you might feel like you have 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes to speak to them and you really want them to understand you just have to be honest. You just have to be very clear. You don't wanna make sure you have a reliable source that kind of is connected to that. Um, you don't wanna find yourself in a exaggeration or a lie with the senator. So let's check, make sure there's not any questions there. So let's give you some ways to kind of think about it. Um, we've talked about a lot of these pieces, show up, um, don't give up, host a local event, sponsor a candidate legislative forum, use the media, Tell your story and in infinite, um, write us a story, vote, stay involved and be active. And a little visual, <laughs> more people uh, make a big difference, right? So you can kind of see here's a school of fish and they're kind of working. There's powers and numbers, right? It's it's really important. Um, we have 15 people on the call. And if, if we could set up a meeting, talk about that, that, you know, with the legislator about an issue, that would be an important way to share that message um, we, I'm working with a group right now that are really concerned about mental health issues, and they want to bring 30 people to the Capitol. 
they'd also like to meet specifically with the chair of both committees that um, that are making decisions on behalf of mental health services. And so I would think that'd be a pretty powerful message if there's 30 people coming with lived experience and they and going back, their story's concise, right? They're polite, they're persistent, they've practiced and they're ready to go with their message and they have a personal story that makes a difference. So any questions? I'm gonna pause here before we go into some of the tools that we've been talking about. How do you build up your own advocacy network? That's a great question. Anybody want to share? I've got some ideas, but anybody want to share how they've done that? Um, I've used relational organizing, which is just connecting people in your circle. So you can you can start with your family and friends and they and get them on board with supporting you. And then they have they ask five friends and what whatever. And so you start with your local community to um, build up the build up the support that would be connected to you. Um, so that's the first part of my answer. Go ahead, Bill. No, oh, that's great, Eric. Thank you. Can I ask I, what the question was again, please. How do you build up your advocacy network? How do you get like if you have something that you're passionate about? How do you develop that network? Because you might. That goes back to that first question. Do you ever feel alone or do you feel powerless? And I think we often feel that way when it comes to advocacy. We might think this only applies to me. I'm the only one with the issue. But how do you build up your network? I get my information from who I'm advocating for before I go and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I set my priorities, kind of make it a list of things. You know, this is where we need to start. This is the middle point. And this is what we're going to do to get it done. Thank you, Brady. Yeah. So I, one thing that I would think about Kristen, one is Kristen, I, I have been in a lot of different meetings with you. I think that you should, yes. you probably have a little bigger of a network than you're recognizing um, that, you, that you do. So I think that, um, I think you probably are already doing some of that. But what I also hear when you ask that question, because I know that you're very connected you're saying I want to be connected to bigger issues, or I want to be part of a group that that provides a little more influence on those issues. Um, yes, I think that it. You know, one thing I think building the network takes time, um, so you have to be patient. I think the second thing is go to forums where where that topic's being discussed. You can do some research on the internet. You can ask questions like this. But let's say, let's say you were very concerned about. You know, we talked earlier. You asked a question about. Um, income limits and that $2,000, maybe that's something that you were actually concerned about. Different um, advocates like maybe Brooke or myself, or maybe even Eric and Brady, um, other people were on the call might say, hey, you should really reach up to upgrade Medicaid, or you should reach out to this group of people who are concerned with that issue. Um, and I'll give you a great example. This summer we had our Youth Leadership Academy and one of the projects we gave the Youth Leadership Academy with each individual was they were supposed to find an issue that they were pa really uh, passionate about. Passionate. And one of them is very, because she had a personal experience where at one time they didn't have a lot of food and they didn't have clothing. And her mom was experiencing some homelessness when they were younger. That's really important to her. So she, while she has a disability and she's an advocate for people with disabilities, she's more concerned about people who don't have food and more concerned about people who don't have a place to live. She got involved with a um, food pantry in her hometown and also a clothing barn kind of that, that gives out free clothes. She started volunteering there, started to work there, and now she's on their board of directors. Um, you also have to be 18 to be on the board of directors and she is under 18 and she went through a process to get an exception because it's so important to her. But to your point, Kristen, how did she develop that network? She knew something that was important to her and then she tried to find an area and then she just started helping. She started out as a volunteer and she'd come in on Saturdays and sort clothes. And they said, oh, you're pretty good at that. We, you're, you know, you're really consistent. We really count on you. You should apply for a job here. She started working there and then she even got more involved and felt like they could do more. That's a great example of someone who 
How did she build it? Because she knew what she was passionate about and just started to find areas that was fine. That's not always that easy and not everybody's always that successful. Um, but there, you know, if, it, if the issue is important to you, um, it, I'm sure it's important to other people and that's a great way to do it, so. Well, employment's important to quite a few people. What's that? So employment and transportation's a pretty big to a lot of us with yeah. disability. Okay. Well, so you know, Amy said this today and I think this is true more than ever, things are a lot more accessible to us because it's not the same thing. And I think all of us would rather be doing this advocacy in person or building relationships in person. I would. <laughs> um, but, but there are, you know, you know, there are Facebook groups, there are, um, you know, there are uh, social media sites that you can kind of, if you have an issue, you want to vet it and make sure that it's accurate and a safe place to be and to kind of work through that advocacy. But there are groups of people that you can kind of connect to that way as well. Um, I'm sure Eric, if he's very involved in his local politics, I bet he gets a lot of emails. <laughs> I bet he gets a lot of um, feedback and a lot of different opportunities to either volunteer or donate money or to make phone calls. Um, I bet he's got a lot of people who have like ideas, you know, whichever party he's involved in, he has a lot of opportunity to share his voice. Right, Eric? Yes. And I was going to give you a tip, Kristen. I don't know uh, what your specific issue that is what you're asking about, but one good connection to get involved in is the local, um, your local region for mental health and disability services region. So get involved with that group, whether it's um, county social services where I am in Black Hawk County, that's the region that I'm a part of. I think there's um, Central Iowa, or not Central Iowa, East Central Iowa, which is involved in the Cedar Rapids region, and then there's the Polk County uh, Mental Health region, and they have a lot of resources to get connected about the issues you were talking about with transportation and employment to help people with disabilities get involved or get connected with funding sources to be able to do those things. Thank you, Eric. I haven't heard of that, that one, so that's good to know. So there's like 14 of these regions around the state and they, they're dealing with uh, mental health and disability services. And like I said, Polk County, East Central Iowa, out of Cedar Rapids, County Social Services, uh, surrounding Black Hawk County. There's about 14 of them around the state and they all deal with the same thing. If, if uh, Bill would like to expand on that, but yeah. That'd be awesome to get that. Can somebody put that in the chat or something so I can get those? For the region? Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you uh, have, do you have the full the, list, Bill? Yeah. I'll do that, Bill. You can keep okay, it Okay, thank you, Brooke. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Brooke. So the, the next slide I have just talks about resources for advocates. And, 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 and these might be the issues that you're concerned about. These, are, these resources are very specific to people in Iowa living with disabilities. Um, we have uh, our uh, Infinet site and we have our ID Action site. And then I'm gonna walk us through the Iowa Legislator site. Um, and so that, I'm gonna stop sharing that real quick and I'm gonna share, um, I almost hit the leave button. <laughs> <laughs> End of session. Let's see here. Hey, Bill, I have a quick question. Yeah. Are you looking for that? So in the advocacy toolkit, it looks like it's been updated, but in the old version, it had a know your state senator worksheet and know your state representative. And I know I found that working with new advocates that that was very helpful because they can write down the information from that page of the website, um, what committees they serve, if they're in a leadership role, it was just very nicely laid out. Do you have that located elsewhere on the website or did it just get removed from the toolkit? It, it did get, are you talking? Um, one it's, it's, it, it was a one page at Know Your State Senator. Then there was a second one pager titled Know Your State Representative. And I've just found over the years, because I do some advocacy one-on-one -on -one trainings for other groups, and I've actually pasted those samples because they're such a great resource to new advocates. Is that the, the tips for meeting with? No, it's it's a worksheet, kind of like the message worksheet, but you fill it out. I can I have I have a screenshot copy oh. of it. Um, 
I can say I can email it to you. Yeah, send it to me. I don't. I actually I'm looking at the old one too because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any key notes, and I don't. Um, I don't think we've had that for a while, Roxanne. I think it might have been in a previous oh. version because it wasn't okay. in the one that we just updated. So that's so, if you want to share in that. Twenty twenty. It was there in twenty twenty. Are you sure? I thought so because I had the link. Well, share it and, with us. Share it with us. All right, us. and then um, on the message worksheet. Um, the toolkits real, I really like the flow and the layout and everything, but is there a way that you can do a, a message worksheet with Global Fields so advocates can type in and print it off and use that as their reference when speaking with legislators? Because sometimes it's hard for people to, to print off and write. We can do that. That's a good idea. Thanks, Roxanne. Yep. Yep. We can talk too our next meeting about that, so. Okay. I was gonna add that uh, when the DD Council first trained me, all these things that we're talking about, knowing who your legislator is, knowing who your state senator or state representative or your congressional district, that was the first thing I was taught and it was drilled in us so that, you know, it was second nature that that was something that we memorized or had memorized by the end of the training. Well, we'll try to have you walk away with that same thing. I don't know why, but I'm not. Let me try this again. Hold on one second. I apologize. I don't know what, why it's not. What are you looking for, Bill? Well, I have all those websites pulled up. Oh, OK. Um, and uh, there they go. Maybe this will work. <laughs> I, uh, um, I did go over this before we got started with uh, Emily and it was all working perfectly fine. <laughs> I don't know why they weren't showing up. So uh, um, hold on one second. So to Eric's point, I'm gonna start with the Iowa legislator. So you have this, um, this is this uh, website we've already put in the chat, but it's iowalegislator.com um, and uh, um, legislator.iowa.gov. And in this website, you guys can all see that it has find your legislator. And this is an easy way for you to do that. So if I went here, um, I'm going to put my address in here. Um, I can spell it right. And it's going to tell me who my to my senator is and my representative. If I wanted to email my representative um, from here, I could click on her name there. And it and it first it tells me what committee she's on and do these resonate with me? Are they are these important to me? They might be um, the appropriations ranking member, commerce, her legislative councils, um, what boards and commissions she's on and then former memberships. It does have a place that I can reach her, her capital phone, and it also has an email that I can click on and find her from there. So um, if I was interested in a leadership and I was interested in a specific position, um, I could click on the leadership one here and I could look at who's, who's in charge of which house here, um, who's the president, who's the majority leader. Um, and again, I could click on one of these. Um, if I wanted to speak to the Democratic whip, for example, Amanda Reagan, I could click here. And again, I would find her information there. Um, so another thing that I would point out here is, um, So you can go specifically to the senators. So you can find all of the senators here in those areas. And you can scroll through if you're certain, if you're wondering about a certain area there that's important. And then I'm gonna hit on one more thing and then I'll pause and see if there's other comments here, but here are the standing committees. So if I go to committees and schedules, here's legislator legislation that's being proposed and committee schedules. But one that's really important to me or that I think that we try to watch pretty carefully is the health and 
Human Services Appropriations Committee. Um, we also look, so those, so there's a, um, hold on, sorry, I don't mean to scroll, make you, but there's the Human Resources Committee here. Um, there's also, a, um, you know, Commerce, or if you're talking about um, education, because sometimes there's things that affect people with disabilities that way. Um, but just for example, if the Health and Human Services Appropriation Committee, I can click on that and it tells me everybody who's part of that committee. Um, there's meeting schedules here, there's committee documents, and there's members photos. So I can also click on that and pull up for each of the committees, it will tell you who's who there from that standpoint and what their role is, chair, vice chair, um, ranking member. Again, if you wanted to specifically email the chair, you can hover over that and link from there too. So that's your, so your legislators, then your committees. Um, and then there's also legislation. Um, I was gonna show you, uh, uh, Amy talked about this earlier, um, about finding the schedule for the day. Um, you can go into here into schedules and meetings. And so if you wanted to look at what's happening at the Senate today or for the next two weeks, you could click on there and it would tell you what committees are occurring during that time. So I see there's some chats there, so I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, oh, okay, any, any other things that other advocates see there that I should, that you'd like to kind of dig into and look a little closer? I have some tips. Yeah, Aaron, um, go for it. I'll, 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 you talk and I'll navigate it. So um, one, one good thing to know is uh, um, at the state legislative, at the state legislative level, you know, it's good to get connected with your uh, elected official and your state legislator, specifically that state legislator. But at the federal level, it's very good to get connected with the staff member because the staff member at the, at the federal level makes everything go. Um, and my other tip was on the local level, as far as applying for different boards and commissions, just make sure to ask. Don't be afraid to ask and also fill out the applications because I've filled out the applications. One year I got on pretty much all of the local boards, not, not quite all of them, but a good number of them because I filled out one application through the city, uh, through my city. And so, you know, just get in there and ask and get involved. Don't be afraid to get to just jump in. That's great, Eric. Yep. I mean, that's how you get started. And like I said, I think a lot of people going back to that first question, do you ever feel powerless? I think a lot of people think, well, it doesn't matter. And here's Eric. He applied and he almost got on every committee. They need people to step forward. They need people to share their voice. And 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 that's how it's done is by a community of people. Um, I, this is where I wanted to go here. I just, I went to committees and then I went to the Senate, but for example, um, on Monday at, at 2 p.m., they're gonna be talking about this bill so you can find out what bill they're gonna cover and which committee is covering it. Um, I, Amy had pointed this out in our meeting earlier, but you can see what the public comments are and you can look at the agenda for the day. So for this day, um, this is a bill an act relating to child care center staff ratios. And then you can click to the bill by going here and going in a little deeper and read through the bill. Um, and it tells you how to do that piece there, so. I'll show them how they can see uh, which groups are registered in support of the bill or not. Okay. Because I think that's helpful for them to know, to see what groups. Yep. Yep, here's just a real quick, here's comments that people had submitted in regards to that. Um, and, and some of them could be a lobbyist or an advocate or some of those people can be individuals. So um, if you're interested to see who's, um, you can search here, lobbyist declarations. 
Um, and so here's a, here's a bill, um, House Senate 622, which is a bill about um, an act modifying the sales tax holiday to include emergency preparation supplies. And uh, um, I guess I'm just looking at. You can click on that bill. Go back to that bill that you just were looking on. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then the left side, you go down to declare declarations. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can see who all. Yep. So there are right now, there are um, there are two undecided, one, four, or there's one, two, three, four, five, six undecided, and two, four as well. And it tells you who they are. So they're clients. So um, Roxanne, do you have a bill do you want us to look up? No, I just thought it would be helpful yeah. because you can see the different um, advocacy groups and and people can only register, register for, against, or undecided on a bill if they have a registered lobbyist. That's how that works. Yeah. And Here's uh, one in regards to a state-funded psychiatric residency program. Um, and you can see here, there's a lot of people registered for this one. And then who they are, IACP, Unity Unit Point, Board of Regents. So on the, you, you could look up House File 656. That's the non-medical switching bill for chronic conditions, or which a lot of chronic conditions are involved in. House File 656. It passed the House Subcommittee on Monday, but it didn't make it through the Senate sub yesterday. There we go. So a lot of statewide health organizations are part of this coalition that are working on this issue for medication stabilization. Yeah. Bill, can you go to the um, the Infinet Bill Tracker website or that portion of your guys' website yep. where you point out at the bottom of each bill, when you discuss the bills on your I'm going to call it the bill list or the billboard. Uh, when you go to the bill tracker and you look at a bill at the bottom of how the bill is designated, you will say the client position is that we're tracking, we're supporting, or we're against something. And right now, um, a lot of the bills say the client position is we're monitoring it. Yep. So as Eric said, this is the Infinite website. Again, another resource to be an advocate. Um, we have a bill tracker. Well, first, let me start kind of just left to right here. Um, we have our news. So every, depending on the, um, depending on this. So here's an article that we had at the beginning of 2022 and just talks about the different top. So um, again, if you were trying to figure out how to watch your legislator in action, you can click on that part. And we went through kind of a user, what's this mean for you? How do you get connected to your um, advocate? Um, governor asked legislators for cut to, or for tax cuts, and it kind of walked through what her priorities were for the year. So um, again, for our Iowa Infinite, um, there's articles that we have that that's the news, and you can actually go back to the archives. I was looking for something the other day, and I wanted to go back to the end of the session and so I went to this issue right here. I thought that might be it, but then I thought this could be closer, this issue eight, and I clicked on that. The session ends and here's the highlights. And so I just kind of read through here just to remind myself what was decided at the end of last year. So here's the highlights. Um, health insurers have to pay equal for telehealth or regional, we talked earlier about the regional mental health disability system and it, it links to the bill there. Um, so there's a lot of information in here about the news. And then as Eric said, we have our bill tracker. Um, and so gives you some information above here about what's going on with the bills. Again, you can search those bills, but um, if you want to click on one, let's see. What do I want to... So it just tells you what's the description. So it describes what's going on here. It requires the development of resources for parents and guardians of children who are deaf or hard of hearing. It establishes an advisory committee to make recommendations. 
Um, it's assigned to a committee, which committee? The Senate Education Committee. And then it talks about um, recent actions and where it's been in the process. And so you can tell this is last year, but you can find out who the committee chairs are through there and the end of the actions. And then it just says um, position, we're tracking it, education, um, topic, subject, and then for more information, you can go there. So um, But that's, that's a great way for you to track different bills that are occurring. Um, you can print that list from there, long-term support services, house floor, and where it's at. And right now there's not any more information from that one as well. So um, the bill tracker I think is a really great tool that we offer up on the Iowa Infinet that helps you kind of track where those things are. There's also resources. And so what I wanted to point out here, because we went through the state, you definitely can, here, this is advocacy. Let me go through, this is the, the one that I think is uh, um, a great way for you guys to stay connected. But advocacy, this goes over, learn more about our current issues. Um, here we have a take action site um, and advocate. And so Eric talked earlier, he's been one of our biggest uh, proponents here in this training, but you have a guide to the legislator. We do have a guide here you could click on. And it just walks you through. I must have been looking up something last time I was on here. Let's see. It's just the Iowa guide to the legislature. This isn't the same as the virtual one, but it gives you a way to navigate who your elected officials are. Um, it introduces the day at the Capitol, but um, let me kind of get down here a little further. Talks about the processes that we talked about, the subcommittee, the committee action, um, the legislative process, and then the timelines in which things are gonna occur this next year. And then, boy, this last uh, 20 minutes of went really fast. I see we're getting kind of close to time. So let me just, I did wanna hit on finding your federal um, so if you wanted to find out who your senator is, you could go here. Um, here's track action, but it's also, um, actually, I think it's through here that, I don't know what that took me back to an older, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> but the federal action here, you can find out what legislation is happening at the federal level, tracking things through the White House um, and a map of the Iowa Congressional District. So it does tell you, um, like Robert had said, here's the four representatives that are um, available at all, but also our two uh, senators and you can email them from there, but you can also see what your districts are. And so you can kind of determine where you live. I live in Polk County, so I have district, district three. Oh. And I would go here, district three would be Cindy Axney, would be my, so I could click on here and it would take me, I'd have to sign up for her newsletter to see everything that she has available to her, which I've already signed up for, but I can go that through that as well. So, um, so all right, that was a lot at the end. <laughs> go ahead, Eric. Remember that the districts and the, uh, the districts have changed for the elections, but the elect the electoral districts are not changed for the legislative session, but for the upcoming elections in November, the districts have changed. So like, you know, uh, the, in terms of redistricting from last year. Why are they doing that? Oh, yes. Why yeah. are they changing it when we, once we figured it out? Every 10 years, population yeah. changes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I could understand that. I'm going to chalk this up to Friday, but Brooke just pointed out to me that uh, we were supposed to be done at 1.15. I appreciate people staying on. I, <laughs> Hugh, I got on a roll, and Hugh was just nodding after everything I said. I felt so empowered to keep speaking, <laughs> and, and it just seemed like I... Uh, well, we definitely need to thank our, our interpreter for staying on an extra 15 minutes. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. Thank you, Dan.
Thank you. Have a good weekend. But um, thank you, everybody. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, you guys all know how to get a hold of me, I think. And uh, really glad that you stayed on with us a little longer. So um, thank you. Thank have you, guys. Friday. Take care. Uh, Take care. Weekend. Oh.